Greetings. This is Brother Eli with another episode of Bible Truth Revealed. Today's teaching is entitled, Are You Destined for Destruction? That is, Are You Destined for Destruction? I will explore the doctrine of predestination as taught in both the New Testament and the Holy Scriptures, which Christians call the Old Testament. So what is the doctrine of predestination? In the Encyclopedia Britannica, under the heading predestination, it says this. Predestination in Christianity, the doctrine that God has eternally chosen those whom he intends to save. So God has chosen whom he intends to save and by doing so, he's also chosen those who have no hope of salvation. Quote number two says, Three types of predestination doctrine with many variations have developed. So different Christian denominations believe in predestination but explain it differently. The doctrine of predestination, as it is most frequently presented, teaches that God chose who would be saved even before the world was created. Also, he chose who would be made for destruction with no hope of salvation. In other words, not everyone can be saved. Only those who were predestined for salvation can and will be saved. Naturally, this doctrine is rejected by most Christians as it contradicts John chapter 3 verse 16 and other passages in the New Testament that suggest that God loves everybody and wants everyone to be saved. Let's look at John chapter 3 verse 16 in the King James Version of the Christian Bible. John chapter 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Most Christians interpret this to say that God loves everybody so much that he gave his son to die so that those people who believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That means that salvation is available to everyone. Now let's see if that's true according to the Holy Scriptures. I will be reading from the Brenton Septuagint translation. Ecclesiasticus or Sirach in the Apocrypha chapter 12 verse 6. Ecclesiasticus which is Sirach in the Apocrypha chapter 12 verse 6 says, For the Most High hateth sinners and will repay vengeance unto the ungodly and keepeth them against the mighty day of their punishment. So it's clear that the God that so loves everybody is not the Most High because the Most High hates sinners. Despite lovey-dovey passages such as John 3.16, there is a minority of Christians who insist that the doctrine of predestination, as most frequently presented, is true and that it is explicitly taught in the New Testament. These Christians usually make statements such as the following. 1. All people were born wicked or totally depraved. 2. God has mercy only on those who are predestined for salvation. 3. Everyone else is predestined for destruction. They are reprobates. 4. There is nothing that anyone can do 
to change their destiny, whether that be salvation or destruction. In this teaching, I will explore the doctrine of predestination in the New Testament. Then I will explore the doctrine of predestination in the Holy Scriptures, which is the Old Testament and the Apocrypha. In the Holy Scriptures, we will learn that some, but not all, people are born wicked. Some people are indeed born wicked. We will also learn that there are two groups of wicked people. One group was born wicked and cannot be saved. This includes those Gentiles who hate the Most High and his people. The other group is those people who choose to reject the Most High. This includes both Israelites and Gentiles, which are the other nations. There are also some people who are not born wicked, but they cannot be saved because the Most High has rejected them as a result of their disobedience. So let's start with the doctrine of predestination in the New Testament. I will be using the King James Version of the Christian Slave Bible. Romans chapter 8 verses 29 to 30. Romans chapter 8 verses 29 to 30 reads thus. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So we see that according to Romans chapter 8, God foreknew or knew beforehand certain people. And these people he predestinated. He determined their destiny which means that they can and will be saved. Those people who were predestinated are the ones who were called, justified, and glorified. This doctrine continues into Romans chapter 9. So I will read Romans chapter 9 verses 11 to 24. That's Romans chapter 9 verses 11 to 24. It reads thus, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, and election means choice, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So it's saying here that before Jacob and Esau were born, before they had a chance to do any good or evil, that God's purpose, which means his choice, might stand. He determined beforehand, he predestined that Jacob could be saved while Esau couldn't. He loved Jacob, but hated Esau. Verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid! For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So he chose to have mercy and compassion on Jacob, and he chose to hate Esau. Verse 16. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. He shows mercy to whom he wills. 
verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. And we know he did not show mercy to Pharaoh, because Pharaoh was destroyed. Verse 18, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. So this is the doctrine of predestination in the New Testament. Verse 19, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who has resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hast not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? In other words, can't God do whatever the hell he wants? Who are you to question God? Verse 22, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Those are those who were predestined for destruction. Verse 23, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. That's those who were predestined unto salvation. Verse 24, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So there we have the doctrine of predestination according to the New Testament. Now let's examine the doctrine of predestination in the Holy Scriptures. Point 1. Some but not all people are born wicked. So some but not all people are born wicked. That's in Psalm chapter 57, verses 4 to 6, in the Septuagint. It's in Psalm chapter 58, verses 3 to 5, in the KJV. I'll be reading Psalm chapter 57, verses 4 to 6, in the Septuagint. It reads thus. Sinners have gone astray from the womb. These are wicked people. They go astray from the womb. They are born wicked. They go astray from the belly. They speak lies. Their venom is like that of a serpent, as that of a deaf asp, and that stops her ears, which will not hear the voice of charmers. So even when people try to calm or tame these people they are like they are deaf they stop their ears they don't listen they don't want to hear why because they are wicked from the very womb it continues nor heed the charm prepared skillfully by the wise so even when wise people take their time and carefully think of the most charming way to present the truth to these wicked people, they never take heed, they never listen. They were born wicked, they will die wicked, they will never change, and they cannot be saved. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 7. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 7 says, I am he that prepared light and formed darkness. So this is the Most High speaking, who make peace and create evil. So the Most High created evil. He created evil spirits and evil people. They are evil, wicked from the very womb. It continues, I am the Lord God that does all these things. So we can see clearly that some people are born wicked but not everyone 
Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 to 5, give us an example of someone who was not born wicked. Jeremiah chapter 1, I will read verses 4 to 5. So this is about Jeremiah the prophet, verse 4. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth from the womb, I sanctified thee. I appointed thee a prophet to the nations. So Jeremiah is an example of someone that the Most High sanctified. He set apart. He prepared him and appointed him to be a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah was not born wicked. Not everyone is born wicked. Number two, there are two groups of wicked people. One group was born wicked, like we've just demonstrated, and they cannot be saved. This group includes those Gentiles who hate the Most High and his people. Exodus chapter 9 I'll read verses 27 to 30 and verses 33 to 35. That's Exodus chapter 9, verses 27 to 30 and verses 33 to 35. It reads thus, And Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Pharaoh has just admitted that he and his people were wicked. Verse 28. Pray then for me to the Lord and let him cause the thunderings of God to cease and the hail and the fire and I will send you forth and ye shall remain no longer. So he is being plagued by the Most High God. He admits that he's wicked and he's begging Moses and Aaron to pray for him so that this plague would stop. And he's promised to let the children of Israel go like the Most High has demanded. Verse 29. And Moses said to him, When I shall have departed from the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord, and the thunderings shall cease, and the hail and the rain shall be no longer, that thou mayest know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for thee and thy servants, I know that ye have not yet feared the Lord. They don't fear the Lord because they are wicked people. They were created wicked and they are fit for destruction. They have no fear of God in their hearts. Verse 33. And Moses went forth from Pharaoh out of the city and stretched out his hands to the Lord. And the thunder ceased and the hail and the rain did not drop on the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder ceased, he continued to sin. This is because he was wicked, just like he admitted. And he hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, because they too were wicked. Verse 35, And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not send forth the children of Israel, as the Lord said to Moses. He did not fear the Most High God, so he did not keep his promise to let the children of Israel go. In the same chapter, chapter 9, we'll read verses 13 to 16. That's Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 to 16. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh, and thou shalt say to him, These things says the Lord God of the Hebrews. It does not say the Lord God of everybody. He is the Lord God of the Hebrews. And he has a message for the Egyptians which are not his people. It says, 
send away my people. Those are the Israelites that they may serve me. For at this present time do I send forth all my plagues into thine heart and the heart of thy servants and of thy people. So notice there's my people and thy people. So this nonsense that people like to say that we're all one people, you will not find that in the Hebrew scriptures. It continues that thou mayest know that there is not another such as I in all the earth. There's no other God like the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in all the earth, despite what Christians would like to believe. Verse 15, For now I will stretch forth my hand, and smite thee, and kill thy people, and thou shalt be consumed from off the earth. If the Most High loved everybody, he would not be threatening to kill Pharaoh and his people, and to wipe them off the earth. Verse 16, And for this purpose hast thou been preserved that I might display in thee my strength, and that my name might be published in all the earth. In other words, Pharaoh, you and your servants were predestined for destruction. I created you so I can wipe you off the face of the earth and display my strength, and the whole world will know that I alone am God. Exodus chapter 10, verses 1 to 2, verse 20 and 27. Exodus chapter 10, verses 1 to 2, verse 20 and verse 27. This is going to show us that the Most High hardens whom he wills. There are some people who cannot and will not be saved because they are wicked and the Most High hardens their hearts. They were predestined for destruction. Verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Go into Pharaoh for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants. The first time we read it was Pharaoh hardened his heart. But now the Most High is hardening the heart of Pharaoh and his servants. Why? It says, that these signs may come upon them in order that ye may relate in the ears of your children and to your children's children in how many things I have mocked the Egyptians and my wonders which I wrought among them. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. The Most High hardened Pharaoh's heart and the hearts of his servants so that they could not change even if they wanted to. They were predestined for destruction and there was no way that they were going to avoid that destruction. There was nothing they could do about it because this was their destiny. Verse 20, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not send away the children of Israel. Verse 27, But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he would not let them go. So why did Pharaoh not let the children of Israel go? Because the Most High hardened his heart. Why? So he could destroy him. He could mock him. And the world would see. There is only one God, the God of the Hebrews, the God of the Israelites. He does not love everybody. If he did, he would have never done this to Pharaoh and his people. Exodus chapter 14, I will read verse 4, verse 8, verses 17 to 18, and verses 26 to 30. That's Exodus chapter 14, verse 4. Verse 8, verses 17 to 18, and verses 26 to 30. It reads thus, 
and I will harden the heart of Pharaoh, and he shall pursue after them. So he wants Pharaoh to chase after the Israelites after he's let them go. And I will be glorified in Pharaoh and in all his host, and all the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Verse 8, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and of his servants, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went forth with a high hand. Pharaoh has to do what the Most High is forcing him to do because the Most High hardened his heart. He couldn't change his mind even if he wanted to. Verse 17 And lo, I will harden the heart of Pharaoh and of all the Egyptians, and they shall go in after them, and I will be glorified upon Pharaoh and on all his host, and on his chariots and his horses, and all the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I am glorified upon Pharaoh and upon his chariots and his horses. Verse 26, And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch forth thy hand over the sea, and let the water be turned back to its place, and let it cover the Egyptians, coming both upon the chariots and the riders. Now the Most High could have easily allowed Pharaoh and his servants to remain in Egypt, but he hardened their hearts and caused them to chase after the Israelites so that he could kill them in the Red Sea. Verse 27 And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the water returned to its place toward day. And the Egyptians fled from the water, and the Lord shook off the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the water returned and covered the chariots, and the riders, and all the forces of Pharaoh, who entered after them into the sea. And there was not left of them even one. The Most High's mercy did not extend to the Egyptians. Not even one was spared. He killed them all. Verse 29. But the children of Israel went along dry land in the midst of the sea. And the water was to them a wall on the right hand and a wall on the left. So the Lord delivered Israel in that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead by the shore of the sea. We can see clearly that Pharaoh and his servants could not be saved even if they wanted to be. For details of another group of Gentiles that cannot be saved, please listen to my teaching entitled, Can Gentiles Be Saved? That is, Can Gentiles Be Saved? The other group of wicked is those people who choose to reject the Most High. This includes both Israelites and Gentiles, which are the other nations. First, let's look at the Israelites who choose to reject the Most High and are called the wicked. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 8 to 16. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 8 to 16 reads thus. When I say... To the sinner, thou shalt surely die, if thou speak not to warn the wicked from his way. The wicked himself shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. So the Most High said to the prophet Ezekiel that when I tell the sinner, which is the wicked person, that he's going to die because of his wickedness, you better go and warn him. Why is that? Because this particular wicked person can repent. 
This person can change from his wicked ways so that he can be spared. Verse 9. But if thou forewarn the wicked of his way to turn from it, and he turn not from his way, he shall die in his ungodliness. But thou hast delivered thine own soul. This shows it is possible for this wicked person to turn from his wickedness. Verse 10. And thou son of man, say to the house of Israel. So these wicked people that the Most High is referring to are Israelites, the house of Israel. Thus have he spoken, saying, Our errors and all iniquities weigh upon us, and we pine away in them, and how then shall we live? Say to them, Thus saith the Lord, As I live, I desire not the death of the ungodly. Remember, the Most High desired the death of Pharaoh and his servants. They were wicked. They were born wicked. They were predestined for destruction. But now, we're looking at a separate group of wicked, ungodly people. And the Most High says, I desire not the death of the ungodly as that the ungodly should turn from his way and live it's a separate group of wicked people this group can repent but they choose to reject the most high turn ye heartily from your way for why will ye die o house of israel it's speaking to the wicked of the house of israel Verse 12, say to the children of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day we are in, he errs. Therefore, if a person is righteous and that person decides to turn around and be wicked, all of the righteousness that he did up to that day will not deliver him from the destruction that is to come. It continues. And the iniquity of the ungodly shall not harm him in the day wherein he turns from his iniquity. So if the ungodly or wicked person repents, which is to return to the laws of the Most High God, then his ungodliness will not be held against him. He will be forgiven. It continues, but the righteous erring shall not be able to deliver himself. So we see here that with this group of people, there is choice. They can choose to be wicked or they can choose to be righteous. But if they're wicked, they'll be destroyed. If they're righteous, they will be saved. If the wicked changes and follows righteousness, his wickedness will not be held against him. If the righteous changes and decides to rebel against the Most High God, all the righteousness that he's done to that point will mean nothing because the Most High will destroy him. This is why people can't say, oh, I'm righteous. I've done all these wonderful things so I can sin once in a while. It doesn't work like that. All of your righteousness will mean nothing when you decide to rebel against the Most High. And he will destroy you. Verse 13. When I say to the righteous, thou shalt live, and he trusts in his righteousness, and shall commit iniquity, none of his righteousnesses shall be remembered. That's what I just explained. In his unrighteousness which he has wrought, in it shall he die. Verse 14, And when I say to the ungodly, Thou shalt surely die, and he shall turn from his sin, which means that he repents and do judgment and justice and return the pledge and repair that which he has robbed and walk in the ordinances of life so as to do no wrong, so he is righted his wrongs, he shall surely live and shall not die. 
This is the wicked who has the opportunity to repent because he was not created wicked. He is wicked by choice. Verse 16. None of his sins which he has committed shall be remembered because he has wrought judgment and righteousness. By them shall he live. So my Israelite brothers and sisters, if you have been wicked, this is the time to repent. Do that which is right and the Most High will forget all the evils you've committed. And you can be saved if you continue in righteousness. Now let's look at Gentiles who are not born wicked but chose to be wicked. Genesis chapter 18 verses 20 to 33. That's Genesis chapter 18 verses 20 to 33. It says, And the Lord said, The cry of Sodom and Gomorrah has been increased towards me, and their sins are very great, meaning they are wicked. Verse 21, I will therefore go down and see if they completely correspond with the cry which comes to me, and if not, that I may know. So the Most High came down to see if the things that were reported to him about Sodom and Gomorrah, the things that he heard about them, were exactly so. Were they as wicked as he heard? If the Most High had created the people of Sodom and Gomorrah to be wicked, meaning if they were born wicked, there would be no need for him to come down and check whether what he heard about them was true. So we know that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were wicked by choice. They were not born wicked. They were not created for destruction. Verse 22. And the men having departed thence came to Sodom. And Abraham was still standing before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wouldest thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? And shall the righteous be as the wicked? So as far as Abraham is concerned, there should be righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 24. Should there be 50 righteous in the city? Wilt thou destroy them? Wilt thou not spare the whole place for the sake of 50 righteous if they be in it? By no means shalt thou do as this thing is so as to destroy the righteous with the wicked, so the righteous shall be as the wicked, by no means. So Abraham is saying, there is no way that you most high would destroy the righteous with the wicked if there are sufficient righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. It continues, thou that judgest the whole earth, shall thou not do right? He knows that the Most High is a righteous judge, and there's no way he's going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. Verse 26, And the Lord said, If there should be in Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will spare the whole city and the whole place for their sakes. So if there's fifty righteous people, I won't destroy it. And Abraham answered and said, Now I have begun to speak to my Lord, and I am earth and ashes, but if the fifty righteous should be diminished to forty-five, so if there is only forty-five people who are righteous, wilt thou destroy the whole city because of the five wanting? And he said, I will not destroy it, if I should find there forty-five. The word find tells us that the Most High is going to have a look, and when he looks, if he finds 45 righteous people, he will not destroy the city. There will be no point of him looking to see if there were 45 righteous people if he had created them wicked. Again, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were not born wicked. They chose to be wicked. They were not created for destruction. Their destruction was the result of their choice to be wicked. Verse 29. 
and he continued to speak to him still and said, But if there should be found there forty, so he's still negotiating, and he said, I will not destroy it for the forty's sake. And he said, Will there be anything against me, Lord, if I shall speak? But if there be found there thirty, and he said, I will not destroy it for the thirty's sake. And he said, Since I am able to speak to the Lord, what if there should be found there twenty? And he said, I will not destroy it if I should find there twenty. And he said, Will there be anything against me, Lord, if I should speak yet once? So one more time. But if there should be found there ten? So notice, Abraham started with fifty. He's now down to ten. And the most High is promising him, If I find these righteous people that you hope are there, I will not destroy the city. It says, and he said, I will not destroy it for the ten's sake. So the Most High knows that there is a chance that there will be ten righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Because he did not create them wicked. They were not born wicked. Verse 33, and the Lord departed when he left off speaking to Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. If it was not possible to find ten righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, the Most High would have said this to Abraham instead of giving him false hope. This tells us that it was possible to find these people because the Most High did not create them wicked. They chose to be wicked. Genesis chapter 19, I will read verses 24 to 25 and verses 27 to 28. That's Genesis chapter 19, verses 24 to 25 and verses 27 to 28. It reads thus, And the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew these cities, and all the country round about, and all that dwelt in the cities, and the plants springing out of the ground. So we know he did not find even ten righteous people. Verse 27. And Abraham rose up early to go to the place where he had stood before the Lord, and he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward the surrounding country, and saw, behold, a flame went up from the earth as the smoke of a furnace. So Abraham only discovered that there were not even ten righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah when he saw that the Most High had destroyed it. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah were wicked by choice. And destruction is a reward of the wicked. Next point. Some people who are not born wicked cannot be saved because the Most High has rejected them as a result of their disobedience. So they were not born wicked, but they get to a point where it's impossible for them to be saved because the Most High has rejected them as a result of their disobedience. This is why we have to obey the Most High while we can. 1 Kings chapter 15 in the Septuagint is 1 Samuel chapter 15 in the KJV. So I'll be reading 1 Kings chapter 15 verses 10 to 11. This is in 1 Samuel 15 10 to 11 in the KJV and it reads thus. And the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I have repented that I have made Saul to be king. So the Most High is regretting his decision to make Saul the king of Israel. For he has turned back from following me and has not kept my word. So Saul chose to be wicked by disobeying the Most High God by not keeping the word of the Most High God. And Samuel was grieved and cried to the Lord all night. First Kings chapter 16 verse 1 
and verses 14 to 15. First Kings chapter 16 in the Septuagint is found in First Samuel chapter 16 in the Kedrevi. I'll be reading verse 1 and verses 14 to 15. And the Lord said to Samuel, How long dost thou mourn for Saul, whereas I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thy horn with oil, and come, I will send thee to Jesse, to Bethlehem, for I have seen among his sons a king for me. The Most High has rejected Saul. It's now too late for Saul. Verse 14, and the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. That's what happens when the Most High rejects someone. He takes his spirit from them. And an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. The Most High sends evil spirits to torment those people who are constantly disobedient, who reject the message to repent. Verse 15, And Saul's servant said to him, Behold now, an evil spirit from the Lord torments thee. So the Most High wants nothing to do with Saul. He took his spirit away from him and put an evil spirit on him to torment him. 1 Kings chapter 28 in the Septuagint is 1 Samuel chapter 28 in the KJV. I will read 1 Kings chapter 28 verses 5 to 7 and verses 15 to 16. Verse 5. And Saul saw the camp of the Philistines, and he was alarmed, and his heart was greatly dismayed. And Saul inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him not, by dreams, nor by manifestations, nor by prophets. So now the Most High is ignoring him. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek for me a woman who has in her a divining spirit, and I will go to her, and inquire of her, and his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman who has in her a divining spirit at Endor. So those who know this account know that this woman, who was a psychic, who had a divining spirit in her, she called up Samuel from the dead so he could speak to Saul. Verse 15, And Samuel said, why hast thou troubled me that I should come up? And Saul said, I am greatly distressed, and the Philistines war against me, and God has departed from me, and no longer hearkens to me, either by the hand of prophets or by dreams. So, Saul is confirming that the Most High wants nothing to do with him. He has departed from him. He no longer answers him. Saul was not born wicked. Saul chose to disobey the Most High and the Most High responded by taking his spirit from him, putting an evil spirit to torment him and then ignoring his prayers, refusing to answer his prayers. And the Most High does that to this very day to those who are intentionally disobedient. It continues, And now I have called thee to tell me what I shall do. And Samuel said, Why askest thou me? Whereas the Lord has departed from thee and taken part with thy neighbor. It is crystal clear that the spirit of the Most High does not strive with man forever. When we are constantly disobedient, when we reject the words of the prophets, when we refuse to repent, there comes a time when the Most High says enough is enough. He takes his spirit away. He puts evil spirits 
on even his own people. He turns his back on those people, refuses to answer their prayer, and has nothing to do with them because now they will receive the reward of the wicked, which means they will be destroyed and they cannot be saved. At this point, it is impossible for them to be saved even if they want to be saved. Psalm chapter 144 in the Septuagint is Psalm chapter 145 in the KJV. I will read Psalm chapter 144 verse 20 in the Septuagint. It says, The Lord preserves all that love him, but all sinners he will utterly destroy. So all sinners will be destroyed, whether they are Israelites or Gentiles. Every single sinner will be utterly destroyed. The only ones who will be saved or preserved are those that love the Most High. And we can demonstrate our love for the Most High by keeping His commandments. When the Most High rejected King Saul and turned his back on him, he made a choice to choose David as the next king. David understood that the Most High could remove his Holy Spirit from him in the same way that he did to King Saul. Therefore, when David sinned by taking another man's wife and having that man killed, then he was confronted by the prophet. David repented. David was afraid that the mercy of the Most High would no longer extend to him. We can read about that in Psalm chapter 50 in the Septuagint, which is Psalm chapter 51 in the KJV. I will read Psalm chapter 50 verses 3 to 4 and verses 11 to 13 in the Septuagint. It says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy great mercy, and according to the multitude of thy compassions, blot out my transgression. David understood that the Most High has mercy on whom he will have mercy, and he has compassion on whom he will have compassion. Passion. It's his choice. So David was genuinely repentant, whereas King Saul was not. David cried out for mercy, and the Most High forgave him. He extended mercy to him. King Saul, in his pride, did not do such thing, and the Most High rejected him and took his Holy Spirit away from him. Verse 4. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 11. Turn away thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. This is genuine repentance. Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit in my inward parts. Cast me not away from thy presence. This means, please do not reject me. Do not throw me away. Do not wipe me off. It continues, and remove not thy Holy Spirit from me. David understood that the Most High removes his Holy Spirit from those that he rejects. Wicked Christians claim that a person cannot lose the Holy Spirit. Yet King Saul lost that spirit and King David knew that it was very possible to lose the Holy Spirit. This is why he begged the Most High not to remove his Holy Spirit from him. In conclusion, 
the doctrine of predestination was stolen from the Holy Scriptures, twisted to suit the needs of the Romans who wrote the New Testament, and accepted by Christians. Nowadays, most Christians reject the doctrine as it is most frequently presented because it contradicts the idea that God loves everybody. On the other hand, the doctrine of predestination as revealed in the Holy Scriptures proves that 1. Some Gentiles are born wicked and cannot be saved. This is why they have such strong hatred for the Most High and his people. 2. There are people, both Israelites and Gentiles, who are not born wicked, but choose to be wicked and reject the Most High. They will also be destroyed if they do not change their ways. And three, some people who are not born wicked can no longer be saved because the Most High has rejected them as a result of their disobedience. I pray that my people will serve the Most High only and keep His commandments while salvation is still available to them. And with that I say, Shalom.